If anyone will ask you today, what technology breakthrough the world needed most, what would you say? It needs to be a technology we could realistically develop in the next 5 to 10 years, so none of that sci-fi fantasy. Stay until the end of this video to find out what is the latest breakthrough in technology that will reshape Earth and will change the way we live day by day. Use the like button, from the beginning of the video, and later you can take it back if you didn't like it. Also don't forget to subscribe and use the notification bell. Is free and will send you notification when we release a new video, so you can be the first to watch. Nuclear fusion, or cheaper safer and cleaner fission energy, are good candidates. Human society would be transformed by economic cheap fusion power, but fusion is certainly not a technology that we can commercialize in the next 10 years. Many people are working on safer and cheaper nuclear fission but that too has many hurdles to overcome and still we need to think about what to do with the nuclear waste to don't affect life on Earth. If, I was to pick one technology that would have the biggest impact on our society today and that is within our reach, it would be cheap scalable energy storage for the grid. The electricity grid works nearly entirely on a just-in-time manufacturing method. We generate the electricity just as it's needed, there is no general warehouse of electricity that we can rely on. Pumped hydroelectricity does provide some storage and is a nearly centuries-old technology, but it's not scalable to our current needs. Lithium-ion batteries are our best option right now. They have proven their worth in the Hornsdale Power Reserve in Australia. It was commissioned primarily as a fast frequency response service, this means it can act as both the load, when the frequency of the grid gets too high, or as a power source, when the frequency of the grid gets too low. Kind of how a flywheel maintains the rotational speed of an engine. Our grids are designed to operate on a particular alternating current frequency. If the grid deviates from that frequency it can cause all kinds of issues, that generally just result in protective measures being activated. To protect the infrastructure, ultimately cuts power to its users. South Australia was struggling with these blackouts in 2016, when tornadoes ripped through and damaged some power lines, this caused the voltage and frequency of the grid to deviate from its baseline. This caused the wind turbines to trip their protective measures, and lower output. Now this was a massive problem because this is what Australia's power generation looked like on that day. The grid, basically did the technological equivalent of a human fainting when they see a drop of blood. A chain reaction of panic leaving 850,000 people without power. As renewables grow, the challenge of preventing blackouts like this is only going to grow, we won't just need fast frequency response but we will also need load shifting, where we have enough storage, to charge batteries when renewables are available, and discharge them when it isn't. This is going to be expensive. Lithium-ion batteries are the cheapest we have right now, but they weren't designed for this job. They are designed to be light and energy dense, for portable electronics, but, for a stationary battery that's a pretty useless trace to have. It's like having an underwater hairdryer. It just doesn't make sense. Lithium batteries are the cheapest form of energy storage available because their mass market adoption has allowed for the economies of scale to reduce their price. But, what if we designed a new type of battery, a battery that was designed from the start, specifically for the grid? To learn more about this, we have to listen to Donald Sadoway, a renowned professor of materials chemistry, at MIT, and founder of liquid metal battery company Ambry. The, the last thing I do is seek the advice of the incumbents. The incumbents are threatened by, by in, uh, radical innovation. You realize that the lithium-ion battery did not come from the battery industry. The battery industry refused to even manufacture the lithium-ion battery. So Sony, Sony wanted a better battery to power their handheld device. And this is 1990, and Sony goes to all of the big battery producers in Japan. And they go and they say, here's the, here's the formulation, build it. And here's a purchase order for pick a number, some tens of millions of dollars. And each and every uh, Japanese battery manufacturer said, no, I'm not building it. We have all of this capital investment in the manufacture of nickel metal hydride batteries. We can't build this battery in that plant. 
And so they said no. But somebody at some point said, you know, if we want to have lithium ion batteries for our appliances, there's only one way we're going to have them. We're going to build them ourselves. And Sony says, we're not a battery company. It says, we need batteries. And there's only one way we're going to get them. We're going to build them ourselves. And so Sony built the first lithium ion battery manufacturing facility. And very soon thereafter, they were getting inquiries from people who were building mobile phones saying, can we have those? And then people who are building uh, mobile computers, laptop computers, can we have those? And by 1995, nickel metal hydride was pretty much uh, displaced. So what battery chemistry is Professor Sadaway trying to build, and can it have the same revolutionizing disruptive effect on grid storage that lithium-ion batteries had for consumer electronics? The idea started simply, Professor Sadaway had decades of experience in electrolysis for the refinement of metals like iron and aluminium, that process takes a lot of energy to refine the metal. So why not try to make that process reversible, and allow the reverse reaction to give electricity back? This is the basic concept of liquid metal batteries. We alloy and de-alloy metals in a perfectly reversible reaction. They don't need to be light, they need to be cheap, and as Professor Sadaway says, I say if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt. So, how do we go about choosing materials? For a battery like this, what the design phase look like? For Professor Sadaway, looking at a periodic table is a different experience for him. This is what he sees, when picking materials for a technology like this, for the liquid metal battery. First, we need to refine our search down to metals and metalloids, which are these elements. Next we need to maximize the difference in electronegativity to maximize our voltage in general. Electronegativity is highest on the top right of the periodic table and lowest on the lower left. So, our electrode materials can be further narrowed down to elements in these two groups. Next, as Professor said, if we want our battery to be dirt cheap, we have to make it out of dirt. So, let's plot our relative abundance of elements of the candidate elements for our negative electrode. Calcium is by far the most common, which is the negative electrode of the Ambry liquid metal battery. However, they didn't arrive at their current electrode materials, just by analyzing the periodic table. Experimentation was vital, as this is a complex and dynamic system. They have tested several combinations of different electrode materials from these two groups, and there are a lot of complicated interactions to consider. Ambry has landed on a calcium antimony cell chemistry. So how does it work? These materials are placed into a ceramic insulated cell together. When a current is applied, the materials begin to heat up, and eventually they will turn to liquid and the metals will separate naturally. As a result of their density difference, the heavier positive electrode sinks to the bottom, with a neutral density electrolyte, separating the lower density negative electrode on top. This makes building the cell very simple. Lithium ion batteries use complicated coating processes, to build their electrodes. This is the charged state. Now when a load is applied, the opposite electric current is experienced. This causes the calcium electrode to break into a calcium ion and two electrons. The calcium ion travels across the electrolyte bridge and combines with the antimony and the electrons that have traveled on the external circuit to form a new alloy. This continues to happen until the calcium electrode is completely consumed. Now, we just have the new mixed alloy and the electrolyte. This is the discharge state. To get back to the charge state, we simply apply the opposite current, and the reverse reaction occurs, and creates a fresh battery. This brings another advantage over the lithium-ion batteries chemistry. Lithium-ion batteries degrade over time, as they are charged and discharged, chemical reactions occur, that damage the electrodes and reduce their ability to hold a charge. Over time, taking a lithium-ion battery from full to zero charge is particularly damaging few as 500 deep cycles, can reduce the capacity of the batteries, by as much as 20%. That represents about a year and four months of daily use. This is why, lithium-ion batteries, are not perfect for electricity grid storage. However, LFP batteries, which Tesla has started using in its Chinese Model 3, degrade much slower, even under deep cycling, and they have stated, that they will use these batteries for stationary storage in the future. Ambry has shown for the liquid metal battery, that their capacity to fade is minimal. Continual creation and destruction of its electrodes allowing us to fully discharge our batteries on a daily basis for upwards of 20 years. 
However, as I'm sure you have been wondering, keeping the calcium and antimony electrodes so hot that they melt, comes with disadvantages. For one we are going to lose some of our electricity. So, Professor explains. So, to, to explain it, if you put 100 units of electricity in, th there are some losses because there's some joule heating and so on and so forth. With liquid metal battery, it's um, about 80%. Because the, the, the difference, the 20%, is the energy loss desirably to heat the battery to keep it at temperature. So you say, wow, 80%, that's 20% loss. What's up with that? The round trip efficiency of pumped hydro is 70%. So we're better than pumped hydro. But the, the thing is that this is a, a case of a, don't, don't answer irrelevant questions because the, the key question is, what is the, the cost of electricity? However, even with the promise of liquid metal batteries, lithium-ion batteries have a major leg up on any potential competitor. They have had decades to work on the manufacturing process and reduce their price and they are still getting cheaper. Ambry has proven that cell chemistry works on the bench scale, but actually bringing a product to market is much harder than proving the science works. It's, it's simply the, the, the long journey from lab bench to, uh, to marketplace. We, you know, uh, here at MIT, I with uh, my, my team of students and postdocs, we worked on this. I had a concept and, and then we, we reduced it to practice and then got it to the point where we said it's time to start a company. Now, how do you take that and turn it into a marketable product that is uh, uh, able to be manufactured, you know, at the university, you know, you, you make five cells and one of them works and, and you get a publication out of it and everybody's high-fiving and so on. But, but in manufacturing, you have to have, everything has to work. So, so we had to design the manufacturing process and there's nobody to turn to. There's no, there's no model. I can take the most brilliant, the most competent, people in the lithium ion battery sector and almost everything that they know is inapplicable because they the lithium ion chemistry is different which means that the format of the battery is different their needs are different i mean they have to guard against thermal rise we have to guard against thermal fall we want to keep our batteries hot they're trying to prevent their batteries from getting hot there are dielectric hermetic seals that have to survive 500, 600 Celsius. So obviously they're going to have to be ceramics, but ceramics are brittle, fragile, and they don't like thermal excursions. But we have to be able to, to uh, endure thermal excursions. And I can give you a ceramic. It can do it like that, but it's going to cost uh, something around a NASA price point. Thank you for watching this episode from Tech People, about new battery technology that are coming. In the future episodes we will dive deep, about other viable and non-sci-fi battery technologies, that will help make our planet cleaner, by using renewable electricity sources. Don't forget to subscribe and tick the notification bell, so you don't miss out the next episode of Tech People. Thank you for watching, and until next time, stay safe.